Today, you'll learn how to have a marine science career even without a PhD, and stick around for the shark bite where we'll discover a shark that can fit in the palm of your hand. You're listening to the Shark Week Podcast! G'day everyone and welcome to Shark Week the Podcast. I'm your host Luke Tipple. Today, I'm really excited because we're talking about marine science, one of my favourite subjects, and we're answering a bunch of questions that I had as a kid. And I know that there's listeners out there today thinking, how can I have a career in marine science? Well, today, we're going to answer those questions for you. Now, before we get too deep into things, make sure you subscribe to this channel, like the video, and ring that little bell so you never miss another one of our weekly podcasts. You know, people that work on the ocean are kind of a rare breed. Most of us are adventurers. We're people who are fascinated with the ocean, with its animals. We dream about getting out on a boat in the middle of the ocean with no land in sight, seeing massive whales and sharks and jellyfish and all these mysterious animals below the water. I mean, it's crazy. There's more water on this planet than there is land. There's more life in the water than there is on land. And when you actually become knowledgeable of that environment and go spend time in that environment, it's incredible the experiences that you can have and how much you can grow as a person just by having a connection with the ocean. And I know that there's a lot of fans of Shark Week and people who just really, really want to work on the ocean who are out there listening to this podcast right now, perhaps dreaming of having exactly that experience, studying something, discovering something, finding something that you're absolutely passionate about. But how do you do it? You know, that was always a question that I had when I was a kid. I always wanted to be Jacques Cousteau. How was I going to do that? I was five. I didn't know. I even went on to study business because I didn't think I could make a career being a marine biologist, but I managed to prove myself wrong, and I'm very stoked that I did. So today's episode is for those people out there who are having those exact same questions and really need some answers. To help us out with that, we have two guests today. Both of them have made careers in marine science, have both taken slightly different routes, and what you learn from them could well change your life. Joining me first is Kelly Link. She's the Associate Curator at Georgia Aquarium. She's got about two decades experience in both field and museum work. So Kelly, it's 2023 and somebody comes to you and says, I really want a career in marine science. What do you say to them? My first question would be, what do you actually want to do with marine science? Because there are a lot of avenues. There's research, there's things like what I do, which is work in an aquarium. There's a lot of different ways people can go with it. So I usually try to ask first, what do you actually want to do with marine science? Um, and then if they say they want to go sort of down the route that I'm on, a four-year degree, most of us have biology degrees, some of us have marine science degrees, but most of us have biology degrees. And then as much hands-on field work, volunteer work, anything that you can get to just sort of start getting your hands wet, literally, <laughs> um, to start understanding what it means to take care of marine animals and get some experience with that. Sure. So why don't you tell everyone uh, about what you do and how you got there? So I'm the associate curator for our shark exhibit here, which means I manage the team that takes care of all of our sharks. Um, our most recent exhibit has our hammerheads, our tiger shark, our sand tigers. So we take care of all the day-to-day the -day maintenance of them, the cleaning, feeding, diving, all the things that are involved with the care of our sharks. I have been here at the aquarium September will be 19 years. So I started out at the very bottom as an entry-level aquarist, and I've worked my way through. I've worked in a lot of different areas. I've done a lot of work in Ocean Voyager with our whale sharks and our mantas. So I kind of had to start with our sharks and rays, and that's sort of what I fell in love with. Um, but I've worked in freshwater and just sort of different areas around the building to get experience with all kinds of different animals and different tanks and sizes and things like that. I think one of the biggest things, uh, I mean, for me, when I was entering marine biology, I went and did a, a, started a degree in international business to start with, because I thought, you know, marine bio would be fun. It's really what I want to do, but I'll never make money on it. I'll never have a real career at it. I better go do the sensible thing and be a business guy or something. And then I dropped out of that after a year and went to did marine bio. Anyway, <laughs> but, uh, for somebody who's taking sort of a, a more traditional academic path, maybe going into, um, you know, an aquarium or something like that. What kind of career can they expect? Like, can they make a good living doing it? So, yes, it is possible. Um, here at the aquarium, we've actually started doing a lot more to make it a much more livable career because historically, a lot of aquarium jobs, zoo jobs, or animal 
animal care jobs in general tend to not be very high paying positions um, because it's a little bit more of a passion type job and they sort of rely on the passion that you do have for those animals to like basically you're like I love my job so I don't care if I get paid a whole lot but there is a line there where you do have to be able to support yourself and support your family it does seem to be the direction that the industry is heading mm. to understand that people can't stay in this industry if they're not making a livable wage to be able to support their family we've yeah. lost a lot of people that can't afford to stay into it and that's a lot of what prompted the aquarium to sort of reevaluate what that looks like for a lot of people well i think you kind of hit the nail on the head there it is a a job that people are passionate about uh -huh. and anytime you have that passion which will drive somebody to volunteer then that can you know exploit it is a is a strong word but it can be you know the action of exploiting somebody's um you know emotions in order uh -huh. to get them to do something that they feel good doing but don't necessarily you know live well doing you know right. um, i mean i've done the same thing you know when i first started you know working as a diver i, I think i was making you know 100 bucks a day or something doing 10 hours a day underwater hand feeding sharks i mean right it's what i wanted to do uh -huh. and to be fair i wasn't spending any money on you know food and electricity and stuff i was living on boats but still when you take a you know thousand yard view of it it's like where is this going dude right uh, and and you have to look ahead to you know in 20 years what are you going to do with yourself can are you still not able to support yourself at that point yeah you know you start to reevaluate like is this what you want to do yeah can and, i still do 10 hours a day underwater right. I, i'd come up i'd be i'd dive twin tanks i'd be down for like two hours i'd come up somebody would hot fill me while i'm sitting on the back of the boat jam some food in my mouth go straight back down that's not like a terrible and, idea <laughs> well uh, it, I mean, everything was safe. Everything was good. But <laughs> I, I will admit, I slept pretty well at the end of the day. Yeah, so I bet. You do that five days in a row, have one day off and then go out again. It, uh -huh. It's a slog, but yeah. it's what I really love doing. Uh -huh. and, and people people love working with animals and the type of work that we do is really rewarding because you do get to spend time with animals and we have animals that you don't really get to see normally. So it is, it's very rewarding. Yeah. But it also can be a challenge when you're struggling to pay your rent or that kind of thing. And that's what the aquarium is trying to change so that people don't have to worry about that and they can make it a career that they want to stay in and that they want to be a part of for a long time. Totally. And you've done a lot of work with sharks. Tell me about that. Oh God, I just love sharks so much. They're such cool animals. Um, sharks are, let me preface, not all sharks, but most sharks are a lot smarter than you think that they are. Um, you say that those dumb sharks? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Which ones are the dumb sharks? Uh, whale sharks are not smart sharks. Well, yeah. Um, they have they have little tiny brains with big giant bodies, but I love them. But they're not very smart sharks. But <laughs> um, like hammerheads have big brains. They're easy to train. They're excited to train. Like they're such fun animals to work with. I always find it fascinating because people think sharks are just sort of these mindless fish, but they're actually way smarter and way more interesting than a lot of people think that they are and just being able to see that and experience that is just such a cool part of my job like they're just such cool animals to work with yeah uh, have you ever had an event where you know a smaller shark's gotten eaten by a bigger shark or yeah. how, how do you guys manage that <laughs> natural predation that they have um in general to manage predation at overall we just try to make sure that we feed everyone as much as we can to ensure that they don't want to eat other animals. Um, but you can't stop that natural behavior. I mean, even you can feed a shark all that you they would ever want to eat, and they're still going to find something that they can chase. Now, with Shark Week just having happened, we're obviously getting influx of people saying, oh, you know, sharks are awesome. I want to follow this guy's career or that girl's career and do that kind of thing. What does a day in the life of, of you or somebody who's working with the sharks look like? A lot of times the job of an aquarist which is what we call ourselves or aquarists it's not as glamorous as some people might think of like you think oh i'm working with sharks and that's amazing and it is but there's also a lot of things that aren't super glamorous when you've got your hands in fish chopping up food or you're cleaning floors or scrubbing algae off of rocks it's not quite as glamorous as people might assume <laughs> but it's still pretty cool and you get but you're to, still scrubbing like, algae off rocks and looking around and there's a whale shark behind you. Right, right. <laughs> and you get to dive in places like 
where else are you going to dive and you're going to have multiple hammerheads and a tiger and a sand tiger? You know, they're not going to go yeah. those. You're not going to see that in the ocean all in one place very often. So it is very cool to have all of those animals in one place to be able to see them and, and work with them. You know, that is a huge appeal to be. I, I took my wife in there and we came up and worked with you guys and um, we went diving and she's, you know, privately petrified of sharks. Um, but <laughs> she went in and had a great time. But the whole time she was worried about getting bit by sharks. How are you guys feeding, especially the larger sharks that could be a potential threat if they associated you with food or you got, you know, mishandled the food or something like that? Yeah, we never offer any food while people are in the water with our larger sharks in the shark exhibit. So they'll, they'll feed like the whale sharks with divers in, but whale sharks are filter feeders, so you're not really worried about that. But our larger sharks, we never offer food if there's divers in the water. Um, and we, we target feed all of our sharks. So they come, they're trained to come to a specific location and eat in a specific way to get their food. And they might come and try to steal food from each other occasionally, but they know where they're supposed to go to get their food. So they associate us on the deck of the exhibit with food, but not anyone in the water. They don't associate divers with food at all. That's really interesting. Uh, it's kind of the opposite of what we see out in, in the open ocean. Um, actually, let's pivot to that because you've done a lot of field work as well. Um, is that kind of a natural extension of your work at the aquarium or was that kind of stage one and now this is stage two? It is doing that kind of field work is a natural extension of what we do. It's something that most of us really want to do. We want to be able to go out and do some of that field work and tag sharks and do all of that stuff. But um, we don't personally have a whole lot of opportunity to do that on our team um, because we have our own research group that does that stuff. And we get a chance to go out with them occasionally, but we're not able to do it all the time. Sure. Um, but it's definitely something that we all want to do. And we think it's really cool when we get the chance to be able to go out and do it. Cool. So let's start with somebody who perhaps either sort of perhaps missed their window of going to college or decided not to go to college, but still wants to follow and pursue a career working with sharks, or at least in sort of the marine environment. How do they do that? Uh, most people, if you don't already have sort of a background in it, if you haven't been able to go to school, the best way is to start volunteering um, or start interning, something like that, just to be able to get some experience. So be willing to go to smaller places and try different things and try things that maybe you wouldn't think that you would love would give you a chance to find out. I never thought that I would love freshwater, but I found out I really like freshwater plants, oddly enough. So okay. you know, I never would have known that if I hadn't gone to work over in freshwater for a little while. So just kind of keeping an open mind of what you want to do. And even if sharks are your ultimate goal, kind of think about what are your ways you might be able to get there. I, with your career and what you've done and your experience in the field and in the aquarium and everything else, if you've got a, you know, 17, 18, 19 year old kid coming up and saying, hey, I really want to do something in this. Let's say you're going to give them a, a career path that actually would be sustainable, that gets them adjacent or at least working with the animals that they'd like to work with. What does that look like? Um, I, I mean, because of the direction the aquarium industry in general is going, I would encourage them to, to look at options that would be in a facility that they would really enjoy working at that has the animals that they're interested in and gives them good opportunities because the industry is headed in the right direction to be able to allow that for a lot more people. Um, and that really is like get your degree and get your, as much experience as you can. Do internships, do volunteering, whatever that looks like. That's really your best bet. E do field work. You know, in college, I did a summer in Mexico working with sea turtles that like I loved every moment of that, but I wouldn't have gotten that experience if I didn't do it when I was in college. So like take advantage of the things that are available to you while you can and just get that experience as much as possible. So I'm a kid. I've been watching Shark Week. I've been listening to you. I've been listening to this whole podcast. I'm enamored with the idea of being, you know, a Jacques Cousteau-esque kind of figure. Do you say go for it? If it's what you love, yes. Um, you know, I think it's really important to find something to do that you're passionate about. Um, and you just have to find the right way to do it. Um, you know, I would never discourage someone that's really excited about it. I love seeing kids that are excited about sharks because I feel like those are the people that we need to kind of help save sharks in the future because sharks are in a lot of trouble. So the more people who love sharks, the better off we are. 
So I would never discourage someone from doing it. It's just about finding the right way to do it and the, the way that works for you best. To continue this conversation, we have Dr. Neil Hammerschlag. He's an academic. He's an entrepreneur. He's kind of been there and done it all, especially when it comes to shark research. So, Neil, if you had someone come to you and say, I want to be a marine biologist today, what advice would you give them? Funnily enough, I generally try to first discourage them into it because I think people have some uh, idea of what they think that is. And, you know, I don't think they realize, you know, this might involve, you know, 10 years of school after, you know, high school or college. Because often what I what I hear from people is that they want to spend time with animals. They want to be in nature. They want to help conserve sharks. But they don't they don't know there's many ways to get there. And so they, they think it's just restricted to marine biology. So I generally try to discourage them to see that they have to be just as passionate about the science and the process of science as they are about the ocean or sharks in order to go into a career that involves science. Cool. Uh, I know that you mentor a, a lot of sort of up and coming scientists and people looking to get into related fields. What do you tell people who want to be you? You know, specifically, they're interested in science, in academia, they, they like sharks, they like the ocean. What's their path? Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, if you want kind of that more, you know, want a path that involves science, I first always try to educate them of what that, what the job actually is. You know, the big thing about being, you know, someone who has my job is that you have to design the projects. You have to, you know, you have to design the projects. You have to come up with funding for the projects. You have to write up those reports from the pro projects. You have to publish those projects. And, you know, if you don't really care about that aspect and you just want to work with the animals, well, you can be a technician. There are scientific researchers that go out and just take direction on what to do, like do the technical aspects. So you don't have to be, have a job as, you know, a principal investigator to be able to do the field work aspect or the lab work aspect. You can be a technician, for example. So if I was coming to you and saying, hey, I really want to... I Thanks for counseling me on this. I really appreciate you dissuading me from, you know, having to go after all this funding and being an academic. I really want to be a technician. Give me the, the three steps or whatever it might be to get into that career. Well, one of the things I really uh, stress is that you need to have a skill. Um, a lot of people come to me and, and, and tell me about their passion and, you know, that they kind of feel that, you know, their passion has brought them to this, this career path. And that, you know, the passion is a driver. And you certainly, and passion is important, right? But if you really like doing the fieldwork aspect, well, you need to have the skills to, you know, for example, be on boats, operate boats, maybe it involves diving, maybe it involves the skills associated uh, with, you know, being a captain or, or, or working with equipment, you know? And for me, often I say is we work with very large data sets. I need someone who can make sense of a large data set that can that can work with that data run it in you know these fancy quantitative software and programs that can make maps and illustrations and show you know show patterns in the data and those are skills that can be learned at school and and learn even learned in online courses those are the things that i really tell people to go out and seek to do what would you say to somebody who really 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 wants to work with sharks i hear that all the time you don't have to go into shark science to work with sharks. You know, there's millions of ways that people can encounter and work with sharks. You know, you can go in the film industry, you can become a photographer, you can work in an aquarium, you can be a journalist, you can be someone who works in government, you can work for a nonprofit. I said, there, there's so many avenues. You know, I think science is a very specific thing. To go into science, you want to you want to love the science, you know, as much as you love the animals, you know, it, it has to be there to drive you as well. If you were to characterize your job and your career and in how much time you're actually exposed and being on the water and working with sharks, what kind of percentage does that look like? Yeah, I think that, uh, to be honest, that my percentage is actually really high and it's probably like 10%. You know, I think for most people, it's a lot lower than that um, because, you know, for every one hour, you know, in, in, the water, there's probably at least 10 hours of planning, if not more, 10% might even be a, a, an overestimate. You, you can't always be out there with, with the animals. Yeah. We've uh, spoken to a few uh, shark divers and, you know, people who do exactly that. They handle sharks, they feed sharks all day long, and that, that is their job. 
When you're setting up an experiment, when you're setting up time to be out on the water academically, there's probably less bravado involved than there might be in what people see on TV. Would that be fair? Yeah, I'd say what, what people see on TV is really not a good reflection often of what the science is. And if it gets close, it's like the greatest hits, you know, and, and you know, Luke, that when you do these shows, there's so much time that's waiting that is not successful. And you don't see that. You only see the best takes of the highlights, you know, and all the time and waiting that you do and the unsuccess is cut out from that. But when you're when you're doing science, like every day is that. Right. And yeah. so I think when people see it on TV there, they don't see the waiting, they don't see the planning per se, um, and they don't see really the failures. So now in 2023, with your experience of you know everything you've been through and knowing which way funding and everything is going and the need for science, do you still say to people, to kids who are coming up, like, yes, going to university in 20 years time is a great and viable uh, career path for you. And that's how to work with animals and marine science. No, absolutely not. One of the big things I just say to people is definitely follow your passion, but make sure you make informed decisions. Think about someone who has the job you want. Really research that job and see if it if it meets your interests and skill sets. And uh, if it does, you know, figure out the path that that person took to get there. Look at their resume and follow that. But if it isn't, look for other avenues. Um, you know, and sometimes you might be surprised. You know, just be open minded. Okay, so that's a lot of information. Let's break it down and summarize a bit. As Neil described, true science, going through academia, becoming a PhD, is a real calling. You have to be in love with the science. You're going to spend a lot of time at school. And if your desire is to work with animals a lot, it's probably not the best career for you. You will make a huge difference. You could change the world with this education. But if you spend 5 or 10% of your life in the field with animals, that would be on the very, very high side of pursuing an academic career. That's not to discourage you. That's just reality. And if that's something you want to do, then we need you in this world. You will make a huge difference. And that's exactly the direction you should go. Just be realistic about what your expectations will be once you graduate. If pursuing academia doesn't sound like the right route for you, but you do want to get a good education and you want to spend more time in the field or working with animals, then being a technician is probably a better route for you. You'd still most likely go and get a bachelor's degree. So you do that three or four years of college, whether it be in marine science, you could do veterinary science, you could do biology, anything like that. But that's your foot in the door to some of these harder to get jobs. You'll also need skills. So that might be a, a boat captain or an expert diver or someone who is excels at fishing. All of those are very needed skills out in the field. And coupled with a bachelor's degree, your resume is going to look really good to somebody who wants a skilled, educated person on their boat or in their aquarium or in their center, where you might be teaching people, you might be handling animals, you might be capturing animals, you might be rehabilitating animals. It'll be a lot more hands-on and you'll spend a lot more time outside or in the field than you would as an academic where you're spending a lot more time in the lab. Now, if college is completely off the table for you, you can still be a technician in the field, but your hands-on skills are going to need to increase. So being a boat captain, being an expert diver or fisher or something in that category will make you very valuable on a boat. And this is where you can really assist scientists in getting the research done. And you might actually spend your entire life out on the water working with animals, capturing animals, sampling them, things like that. You could also take a different route, as Neil said. You could be an analyst or work in statistics or work in computer modeling. All of those are highly valuable skills and definitely needed, especially in compiling reports that require a lot of data analysis. And those are things that you can learn online and there is a large demand for it. And then if all you want to do is to work on the water with sharks or dolphins or turtles for that matter, if your one goal is to work daily with animals, then probably tourism is the better route for you. And this is a route that a lot of people I know have taken because they got into college or they got into whatever they were doing thinking that they'd be working with animals all the time. And that's not the reality of a lot of education choices. So they work in tourism where they take people out on the water and get to dive every single day with sharks. Check out episode three of this season of our podcast if you want an example where I talk to two shark divers. And that is literally what they do. They hand feed sharks every single day of their working life. And that is their life's calling. It's what they love to do. 
you know, you could take that same application and do like dolphin tours or turtle tours or work in a rescue center as a volunteer. Now, I will say that those jobs aren't necessarily really well paid, but they are highly rewarding. And if I can leave you with a piece of advice, life is short. Admittedly, it could be shorter when you work with sharks, but it's way better when you do. Look, I, from somebody who's never had all that much certainty in their career, all I ever knew was that I wanted to work with sharks. I wanted to work on the ocean and I've been fortunate enough to do so, but it's never been a very clear path. I've taken opportunities when they've come up and I've never really been certain about where it's going, but it's all kind of linked together. So if you're somebody who's out there, I don't care what age you are, and you have an unfounded passion to work with animals, with sharks, with the ocean, or anything on this planet that's a little bit out of the ordinary, something that we'd call like a passion job. Life is short, and you might regret not following those passions, no matter where they might lead. And I promise you, it might not lead to riches, but it'll certainly lead to experience, and that's something that no money can buy. Okay, time for today's Shark Bite, where Sierra leaves us with a cool ocean story to end the show. What have you got for us today, Sierra? Yeah, today I'm going to tell you about this teeny tiny shark that fits in the palm of your hand. Oh, cute. <laughs> it's called the Dwarf Lantern Shark, and they're pretty elusive. They haven't been seen many times, but when they are spotted, they're off the northern tip of South America, so they're in the Caribbean Sea. While they can get up to about eight inches, they're usually around six inches, so they're pretty small. Yeah, and they're a deep water shark, right? Yeah, so they're found at depths between 900 and 1,400 feet, so pretty deep down there. And other than being the world's smallest shark, is there anything else that makes them cool? Yeah, so they are bioluminescent. They light up. They have these light-emitting organs called photophores that are on their belly and fins. And so it's thought that when they're more near the surface and they light up, that that light mingles with the light from the sun coming through the water and actually camouflages them from predators from below. But that when they're in darker water, that same light attracts smaller animals that they can then feed on. Pretty smart shark for a little guy. Yeah, I'd <laughs> say. <laughs> Thanks, Sierra. Yeah, anytime. That's it for today's episode of Shark Week, the podcast. I want to thank my guests, Kelly and Neil, for joining me and sharing their knowledge with everybody. I really hope you learned something and perhaps we made a difference in your life. Until next time, I'm Luke Tipple. I'll chat to you soon. To the Shock Week Podcast!